Welcome to the uh, Rotax troubleshooting tips. Uh, I'm going to talk about E10 today, uh, charging systems and crankshaft bearings, which primarily has to do with the uh, two-stroke engines. So uh, thank you very much for uh, UPAC for hosting this event and having the convention. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today, and uh, thanks for coming. And also, yes, thank you for your uh, your patronage and your support because this is what I do full time. So if I didn't have uh, the support from uh, from everybody, uh, I'm more than happy to help everybody out, and uh, it allows me to do what I love to do. Now, oh yeah, disclaimer: I'm not employed by Rotax. I do own and operate an independent uh, Rotax uh, uh, repair facility. I'm in Whitby, so not too far, just a little uh, east of Toronto. Uh, these presentations that I do, these are all my own opinions and they may or may not be endorsed by Rotax and uh, use my personal suggestions at your own risk. All right. <laughs> okay, so there we go. What do we got now? We have gasoline and corn, right? This is the way I look at it, right? So we've got our ethanol mixed in. Uh, so what challenges does that make for us now? So no pure 91 gas, right? There isn't any pure 91 gas. Well, there may be some of it still around a little bit, but it's going to be gone. Um, all the fuel that I've tested has had almost 10% ethanol in it already. So I consider it here and I consider it here to stay. Now, uh, I did put an article in the latest Light Flight. I don't know if everybody's read that one uh, yet or not. Maybe you got some questions from it. Um, maybe I should expand upon some more things. Now, and before we go on, I'm, I'm not a fuel expert. I just study a lot of things. When I get a topic that I like, I get into it and I want to find out as much as I can about it. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I don't work for one of the gas companies. Uh, so Rotax, when we're talking about Rotax in particular, 10% uh, ethanol is quite acceptable to burn in all of our engines. So do we have to worry about damaging the engine with 10%? No, because they've already said it's fine. On the two strokes, they've tested it on, specifically tested it on 503 and 582. If you have something else, 447, uh, 618, something like that, they just haven't tested it on those engines because they're older. Okay, they've tested it and approved it on the newer version. So we can only assume if it's going to work on a 582 or a 503, it'll work on a 447. Uh, now, if you go to rotaxowner.com I don't know if you're familiar with that you can go to that website and for zero money you can download all of the documentation for your engine whether it's a four stroke a two stroke whatever it is it's all there it's free uh, you can put it on your iPad on your phone so when you need a specification or something you've got it right at your fingertips um, anybody can phone me anytime and ask a question not a problem but it would be nice if you would try and find it in the book first or you found it in the book and you don't understand it then just call me okay so that's an open invitation anytime it's, it, i don't mind that at all so uh maybe not the best title but ethanol issues okay ethanol is hydroscopic so that means that it's looking for moisture it wants water Okay, it really wants to soak up water. Now we didn't have to worry about this or think about it when we had Pure 91 because it was gasoline. Now, we have to remember that our fuel tanks in our aircraft are vented to the atmosphere seven days a week, 24 hours, right? So there's easy access for moisture or for the ethanol to try and bring in uh, moisture. Now in your car, it's a closed loop system uh, where the fumes don't get away, et cetera, and it's all self-contained. And it's not gonna pick up that kind of moisture. But in the aircraft, absolutely. So next line, E10. So best before date, 30 days. If it's older than 30 days, I would drain it out and I would put it in your car. That's my recommendation for fuel now. It's always been, 30 days to make sure you had nice fresh fuel and it worked good. 
But now I think it's critical that you shouldn't use, you know, what I'll call old scale fuel. Now, another thing that we're doing is uh, you've, you've got a, a, a way to sump your tank and check and see if you have any water uh, using the old cup, whatever, and uh, have a look and see. Now, when we were using pure 91 fuel and you saw, um, here's my example would be, there's some slight intrusion of moisture into the tank and I'm running on pure 91. So I would sump it and I would see maybe a little trace of moisture. Now all I'm gonna do, everything is the same, the intrusion is still the same, I'm switching over to run E10 and I check it and do I find any moisture in my sample cup? No. Why not? Where'd it go? It's still going in there. Where is it? The ethanol is absorbing it. Okay, so if you have some water intrusion into the fuel tank, a small amount, you're really not going to see it. The fuel is going to soak it up and you're going to burn it. Now, if you sump the tank and find out that there's actually water that you can see, wow, there is a lot of water in there. So if I think of the ethanol content uh, like a bit of a sponge, so some moisture came in to the fuel tank and now my sponge is saturated. Where's the extra water gonna go? It's gonna go down in the bottom of the tank and I'm gonna get it as a sample. So just because you don't see water when you sample doesn't mean it's not there. But if you do see water, there's lots of it. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what I wanted to get, get the point I wanted to get through to try and understand how it works. Um, so that would mean that the ethanol portion of the fuel is saturated. Okay. It, it's like your sponge. You can't hold any more water. Now, if you let it sit, okay, then what happens is phase separation. So what phase separation is, is now that the ethanol is completely full, your sponge is completely soaked, now what's gonna happen is, after a little bit, and it does take time, more than 30 days, but it's gonna actually break away and separate away from the gasoline. So what you end up with is you end up with some lower octane fuel, uh, if, if it was uh, 87, who knows what's on top now? Could be 82, 83, 80, I have no idea. But much less octane in that fuel that's above. And this mess that's underneath, this gooey, yucky stuff, that is very, very corrosive then. So it's not going to go through the fuel filter. It's, it's just not going to do anything. So you're going to end up with big problems. And you're going to end up with big corrosion problems. Um, I just took a, um, I have an airboat in the shop right now and uh, the fuel pump is the most corroded thing I've ever seen for a round Makuni pump because they just use um, regular gas in it, which is fine. And, um, uh, and with 10% ethanol and it just sits, like it just sits and sits and sits. So the corrosion is there. Um, I didn't see what was in the tank because they did flush the tank before I got it and refilled it with fresh fuel. But uh, anyway, that's the idea. Phase separation is when it just can't hold any more water and then it just breaks away from the fuel. So it's not a blend anymore. Now it's two different things. We don't want to get there. So I already said that Rotax says 10%, uh, we can burn 10% in the engine with no problem. Well, where, where is there a problem? Exactly, getting it from the gas cap to the fuel pump, okay? The engine will burn it, the fuel pump will run on it, no problem, but you gotta get it there. So some of the issues uh, is because ethanol is a really good solvent, and what, is, what does that mean, what's it gonna do? Well, if it has, I'll call it natural rubber on the gas cap, the little ring, it's gonna swell up. So years ago, we when, when I had the um, late model stock car, they made us run on track fuel and there must have been a lot of ethanol in it because we used to have spare gaskets and halfway through the night we would the gasket would swell up and the gas would leak out of the out of the fuel cell so we would put another fresh rubber on it put that one aside and then use it next week 
So it, it does swell things up. Uh, so you know right away whether it's a, uh, it's a piece of rubber that will withstand the, uh, the, the uh, solvent effects of it. Um, the fuel lines is really important. So right there, that, that SAE 30R7, so that hose is certified for up to 85%, so E85, and it's a 50-pound hose. Now, if you're putting any of that, replacing any line on your airplanes, you can use, for the two strokes, you can use the, 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 um, the blue, we'll call it the plastic line everybody's familiar with, uh, and, and uh, you can use the rubber, but it needs to be that specification. What the difference is, is the rubber fuel line that's cheaper, that goes on a 57 Chev, they didn't have the, these issues. It was good for like 10 pounds pressure, and it was more, I guess I would call it more natural rubber, and it won't withstand ethanol. So it's one thing that you can do is check and make sure that your fuel lines are proper. So when you get a length of hose, you can stretch it out. It'll have, you know, quarter inch, five sixteenths, and it'll also have that SAE number on it. So that's important. Uh, the next one is the fuel tank material. Well, what, what's your fuel tank? Is it, um, is it fiberglass? Is it a steel, like a metal one that's been, uh, that's been uh, sloshed, so coated? Will that material withstand the solvent effects of ethanol? Don't know. So how do you find out? You know, you need to can't get a hold of the uh, airframe manufacturer and find out if they know. So as an example, I think I use it in the uh, article, my Challenger's got a long range tank in it and it looks like fiberglass, but it's some other kind of composite and it's no problem to use ethanol with it. But how do you know this is the thing? So you need to contact the manufacturers and find it. Um, what else here? So that's that. So the, uh, what, 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 what can we do? Well, maybe we can and maybe we can't. Can we replace the, the uh, your old metal tank with slosh in it? Can you put a plastic tank in it? Who knows, will it fit? Maybe it will, maybe it's impossible. So what do we do now? The manufacturer is gone and, uh, and, and we don't really know for sure what the tank is made of because just because it looks like fiberglass doesn't mean it is. So, we can monitor it. So how are we going to do it? Uh, I would recommend a clear type gas filter, fuel filter, and then you want to inspect it and find out if it has these little hairs in it. So if you have a tank that you think might be fiberglass and the ethanol is going to affect it and break down the, the epoxy that holds it together, all of these little teeny little fine hairs are going to start to break loose go down the fuel line and end up in the fuel filter. So that's just a way that, that, uh, that, that's the way I would do it. If I had, if I was in that situation, that's probably what I would do. Because the option is, well, the option is you could use 100 low lead, which is more difficult to get. It's the same as I had in the article. It's more difficult to get. Um, they don't want to put it in a can, so you can take it away. Typically, they only want to pump it into, into an aircraft. And uh, you, you know, you got to go to get it and fetch it. And the worst part is it's really dirty inside the engine. So on a two stroke, you'll get 25 hours on a set of plugs instead of 50. Like it's, everything is accelerated and it's dirty and it's gross. So uh, what I would do is just go with the, uh, the, the, the E10 and I would be looking at my fuel filter very regularly until I knew. So that's, that's the only suggestion I have for that. Does that make sense? then you can monitor it through the fuel filter what's coming out of it. Okay, so charging stuff. You get, got quite a few uh, questions, phone calls this year on charging um, issues. My plane won't start. So it usually is the, uh, the battery was just dead and they gave it a boost and it starts fine. So First thing is, well, is the battery any good? Well, yeah, the battery has been charged and it's been tested and it's fine. So, okay, so it's not the battery. 
So what do we do now? All you need to test it is one of these, a DVOM, okay? If you don't have one, well, first off, if you have one, hopefully you'll learn how it works because some people go, they go, yeah, I got one, but I don't know how it works. You go, okay, <laughs> let me see if I can help you with that. So if you're gonna buy one, I would suggest you get one that's auto ranging. So in other words, if you're checking uh, resistance with it, you don't have to set it to a high or a low scale manually. It just does it for you. It's just simpler and they're not much more money. They're, these things are available very inexpensively today. So that's, that is the only tool you're gonna need. So here's our stator, and I don't know how many people have seen the stator. This is from a two-stroke, and uh, so it would be, you know, 582, 503. They they all fit to their same number. So what do we see here? So we have these black ones right here. So these are paired up, two two per ignition, and they they're the ones that actually power the ignition system, okay? So we have, they run down here, and it's, the, it's the, uh, the white and the green leads, and they go to these, these flat plugs here. And of course, the longer one is for the coil, it's further away. Now, what I really wanted to focus on with this one with charging is these other coils right here, these are the ones that produce the power to charge your battery, run your electric loads, okay? So just an understanding, this whole section here, this is ignition only. It does nothing to charge the battery. Speaking of battery, that's low. Uh, anyway, and so we're gonna talk about this, this part here. So now that we uh, we got to the point of finding out that uh, that, that whoever the, the one on the person on the phone has said yeah you know it uh, it starts okay so what does this eliminate right there it eliminates the starter and the big what I call the big cables that go from the battery to the starter because when you give it a boost it works so that part just by uh, by the way that it does function it works so what do we do now why how do we find out why the battery is going dead well visually inspect right look for corroded wires um, anything that has to do with the voltage regulator whichever style it is all the way to the battery so you may find it very simply just by looking and wiggling around things you might find the might find the problem so the other one is now is when you need to know how the ohm function works on your dvom because you want to take and put one end of it at the battery positive and go and the other lead for the test meter on the wire that goes to positive on the voltage regulator. What are we trying to find out? Is the thing hooked up? Is the wire broken? Is the fuse burned out? You never know. And then we're gonna do the same thing with the, uh, excuse me, with the ground from the battery either to the airframe, then it runs through the airframe with a small wire at the regulator or some of them have a completely separate wire it depends what you're looking at but what we're trying to do is find continuity is the voltage regulator negative hooked up somehow to the negative of the battery so we have a circuit okay and uh it it, uh, it when you have a meter it's easy to do so then we've uh, we've done that and we found out that the battery, the positive and the negative on the battery is actually is hooked up to the voltage regulator. Okay, so that part's good. So now we need to go on the engine side, right? We've done battery, regulator, now we need to go to the engine. So the stator, it works just like the alternator in your car and, and how it really functions, if you remember the, the picture, it has all the wires wound around the metal cores. So, and, and the flywheel has magnets in it. So any time that you move a magnet by a coil of wire north-south, it's gonna induce voltage. So it's not gonna be weak magnets. Like I've never seen the magnets go bad in a flywheel yet. Uh, so if, if the wire has continuity, then we're good. 
So first thing is unplug the wires where the where it connects onto the airframe. And if it's a Rotax setup, typically there is a white plug with four wires and a small white plug with two wires. Those two wires are the ones for the charging system and they melt all the time. Okay, so that's a real common failure point. So I had a fellow ask me these questions and I said, check that, unplug this, have a look at it. Is it good? Oh yeah, it's all fine. Okay, so he decided that his stator was defective. So he took the engine off the airplane, took the stator out of the engine and then realized that the plug was melted. And I went, hmm, must have missed that part. So, you know, don't, it was a lot of a lot of work for, uh, well, it was good practice, I guess. But uh, anyway, so it's common for the plug to be melted or some kind of, I've seen them with, with four wire trailer connectors and they're plugged in between the engine harness and the airframe. There's all kinds of different combos, but check that stuff. It's a connection, it can melt. It, uh, it'll put out, uh, um, well, it's got a 15 amp fuse, so it's got a reasonable amount of power to go through. It's like 12 amps it puts out. Um, now, so I took the plug uh, apart, I examined it, and it's perfect. Okay, so what do I know so far? I'm going from my battery to my regulator, and now my regulator to that plug, it looks good. Okay, so again, I take my DVOM, and I take those two wires that come from the stator, and I check, is there a circuit? through all of those coils of wire and back out again? Yes, there is. Okay, well, we know that if it has, there's specs for resistance for it, but as far as I'm concerned, there it's either open, so there's no continuity whatsoever, or there's, there is some circuit. If there's a circuit and it has a wire wrapped around a piece of metal with a magnet going by, it's going to make electricity. So that's a real quick way to, to, uh, to check that out. Um, now, what we can do next is we go, okay, well, that looked good. Okay, let's find out if the stator actually has voltage output. So we'll, we'll set the DVOM the, over to AC volts because the stator makes AC volts because we're inducing a voltage with magnets. So it makes AC voltage. And that's what feeds actually to your regu rectifier regulator. So what we'll do is we hook, we'll uh, hook the, um, we've got the, the two leads, now we're on AC scale, and it's auto, uh, if it's an auto uh, set one, it's even simpler. And then we'll just start the engine up, make sure everything is safe, start the engine up. And if you see a voltage there, it works. It'll make like 75 volts when it's revved way up, it'll make 25 or 30 volts at idle. So if you see a voltage there, Okay, so what could that tell us now? We know that the stator works. We've actually function tested it. It puts out voltage. It goes to the regulator, but nothing's coming into the regulator. Then it looks like there's something wrong with the regulator. So it's just a way to troubleshoot it systematically so that you don't end up taking the engine off to take the stator out only to find it had you know, a bad wire or something, right? So. Stator failure is not common. They don't go bad very often. It's uh, the only time uh, that, that they would have an issue is if the engine vibrated really bad. And for some reason, the epoxy, all of those wires, they're all shiny. They're all put together and they're coated with epoxy to keep them from moving. Just like a lot of electronic components, right? If it vibrates, the wire will break. So it doesn't happen very often. So now if you want to look go further with this and, and actually see how to do this, I brought my uh, ignition slash charging system test um, um, machine from the shop. And at 11 o'clock uh, in the booth, I'm going to do, I think we'll do it in the booth anyway, um, a hands-on with that. So there's a meter there, you know, everything is all exposed and you can do some testing and you can get an idea of how this all works. So if you want to do that, you're more than welcome to come. Okay, crankshaft bearings. So uh, you probably recognize that as a 503 two-stroke crankshaft. 
So it seems like the biggest issue is at this end. This is the PTO end and the mag end over here, of course. And with these two bearings, it seems to be where we see issues with these. So what's the deal? Okay. They're not bearing failures. These bearings are fabulous quality. Not to say that maybe one in a jillion isn't quite up to snuff and nobody's perfect. But the way that I look at it, they're, uh, these ones are expensive. They're manufactured with the ultimate quality control. All the balls are around as they can be. All the raceways where the ball goes, it's as smooth as could be. Um, it's got the uh, fiberglass reinforced polymid uh, cage in it. I mean, these are real good quality bearings. So why would they not work right? Well, this is something that uh, somebody had an engine failure uh, a little while ago and said, well, hey, this, uh, this engine's got, oh, what was it? I think about 130 hours on it or something and, and it failed the bearing and it stopped. Uh, so you had your, uh, your in-flight engine, engine out, right? Your sudden image engine stoppage. So I said, well, there's three real things. Um, and this, this was on a Challenger, so I ended up with three reasons. Uh, three real suspect areas where we can get this crankshaft bearing failure from. This is number one, okay? Uh, internal corrosion. So it's uh, the engine's just sitting around. Uh, it's, uh, I, I took an engine apart one time for an inspection and it was all full of corrosion. And I said, I thought this airplane was in a hangar. And he said, yeah. I says, is it dry? Yeah. He said, well, we're, I don't understand where all this moisture came from to do this. Oh, he said, oh, the hangar I used to be in. He said, when I opened the door, the walls were wet. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Just because it's in a building doesn't mean that it's going to be, uh, you know, dry and, uh, and the, the things that we would like our airplane to be sitting in. Uh, so, good example, low hours, older airplane. It's been sitting around. You know, I guess we would call that a hangar queen, right? So these are the ones that end up with, uh, with, with some problems. Now, what happens then is um, it's been sitting around for a long time, low hours, beautiful airplane. It starts, it runs, everything, is, life is good. Somebody walks away from the airplane in the fall, just like it's a lawnmower, and they get back in it in the springtime, and it starts, it runs, and they go, yeah, I'm good, okay. If it will go for about four to six hours without stopping, it didn't have corrosion in it. If there's any corrosion on that crankshaft, it will go, I would say average four to six hours and it'll stop. So, and I've seen it lots of times and that's why I can actually come up with a definitive timeline on that four to six hours. So if, uh, if, if you're gonna buy an airplane that's been sitting around for a long time, yeah, do a lot of circuits for a long time. When you get 10 hours worth of circuits in, you know, maybe you're all right. The real thing to do is, of course, dismantle the engine and do an inspection on it and find out. But some people, they don't do that. So how does this all take place? If we look at, uh, uh, let's look at an inverted engine, for example. What's at the top of an inverted engine? the crankshaft nice big piece of metal up in the top there. okay so when the moisture um, travels when it's parked and the moisture travels up the tailpipe and out the air cleaner or vice versa on its way through the engine on one cylinder or the other because these engines usually stop in about the same place every time so if it's the uh, if you happen if you happen to look at it and see they'll be in about the same place every time it's car engines are the same anyway whatever cylinder is exposed most of the time to this airflow through the engine while the air the atmospheric air is going through it's going to drop some moisture in there and eventually with daytime nighttime cooling etc it's going to end up with some water droplets in it right it's like uh, steam uh, on the bottom of the cupboard from the kettle boiling so now they're on a metal crankshaft, so they're gonna be a little stalactite hanging there of rust. Okay, will the engine still start with that rust on there? Yeah, absolutely. So now it takes about, 
the span of you know three four or five hours for it to get dissolved into suspension with the gas and the oil and now it's just like this toothpaste grinding compound going through the that half of the engine and then what happens the bearing just gets hot because it's got grit in it now it doesn't have good lubrication it's got grit in it so now the fiberglass reinforced polymer cage which is the ultimate in bearing cages it'll actually melt okay it's not because it's a cheap bearing it's not because it's plastic it's just being ground to pieces you know it's just so much heat now as soon as the cage melts what does the cage do the cage keeps all the balls evenly spaced so it can carry load all the way around all the time so as soon as the cage is melted now all the balls go and touch together so now we have a lot of the crankshafts not even supported because all the balls are down here and, and as it goes around and, the, and there's nothing on the other side to support the back of the crankshaft then then that makes incredible amount of heat now that all the balls are rubbing together and what happens then well it just gets so hot that it just welds itself together and it stops so it either spins in the crankcase or it spins on the crankshaft and then once it does that the crankshaft's no good anyway even if the rest of it was good it's no good at that point so the uh that's why they uh that's why they fail so that's why you have sudden engine stoppage so i tell everybody that phones that they they're gonna buy this airplane and they're looking at it and and you know, and, and I get it, they're in love with the thing already and they haven't even bought it yet. Okay, what does it cost to do the engine or whatever? Go, go look, you know what? You need to inspect the engine on this so that you know what you've got when you start flying. You know, it's typically somebody who doesn't, who's gonna take lessons in their own airplane they haven't even flown yet. Why take the chance? So I always advise them to, uh, to uh, do an engine inspection on it. So is that an interesting story of how this all works? it's more understandable now right i mean it's not a bad bearing you just tortured the thing to death and it finally gave up you know that's that's the way it is now the third part is especially like a quad city challenger or anything that has a belt on it, a belt drive okay so we're not talking about gearboxes just belt drives because what can we do is we can just crush the poor bearing with the belt now, originally, the uh, original spec uh, was uh, 30 pounds. Uh, and this was back from, I don't know, when they first made it, like 85 or something. If you still look today, they've, they have still got that specification in there. So if somebody new buys a Challenger, they get a new belt for it, they're going to put it on. If they're doing what they should be doing with airplanes, they should look for this spec. Okay, they do it to 30 pounds. Well, here's the problem. The original belt was really stretchy i'll call it really really stretchy the original one we're on like the fourth yeah fourth iteration now that thing is like a steel strap now they don't stretch at all so on a on a challenger then that big piece of aluminum that that redrive the, the thing, that gets taller as the engine gets hot and even taller in the summertime and the big pulley on the top it gets much bigger around so if you do it the 30 pounds on the ground, I've no idea how tight it is when it's flying, but it's really tight. So if you can picture the bearing with its balls all spaced out nicely by the, the cage, and we're trying to pull that crankshaft up so hard because the belt is just pulling on it that hard, what happens? Well, the, the fiberglass reinforced polymer cage, it actually breaks because it's making the balls go like this. Right, the balls are here, and it's pulling up so hard that they're trying to go away. So if you see, uh, that's the fa failure that you see on a Challenger where the belt's too tight is the, is the cage is broken into little pieces. Okay, not it's not the fault of the bearing, it's overloaded it. Does it make sense like that? Okay, so on these ones, uh, the difference now is, is um, the the, uh, the the sheet that I have that I that I that I give out I do them to eight pounds big difference right eight pounds cold instead of thirty and sometimes you have to maybe slacken it off a tick more uh, because it gets that tight oh go ahead watch the wires 
So this is typically the uh, this is typically the one for uh, like I say anything with a belt drive on it. If the belt's too tight, you just crush the bearing. You just crush it. Poor thing, it's not its fault. <laughs> now, oh yeah, okay, and seasonally adjusted. So if you put a new belt on a Challenger in the wintertime, and it, and it, of course, cool, and you've adjusted it, and you come to the summertime, it's going to be too tight anyway. You're going to have to change it seasonally. Those belts are that tight. So the aluminum gets taller, the pulley gets bigger, much bigger in the summer, it's going to make the belt tighter again. So it's something that you got to do. So if you know somebody with a Challenger, that's a good, uh, uh, a good thing for them to, uh, to know. Now, concentricity, a word I always have a hard time with. So what is it? Is the, is, it's a crooked crankshaft. Um, so it can be on an engine that's in service, and it can be on a brand new crankshaft. So just because the crank comes out of the box brand new doesn't mean it's straight as it needs to be. So, uh, yeah, there's a document in the box uh, down in the bottom that nobody probably ever looked at. And it says you must put this in a suitable fixture and check the, the runout on this crankshaft to make sure it's within specifications. If it's more than two thousandths of an inch, send it back. It's defective. Now, mishandled engines, if somebody's trying to get, I don't know, they're, they're trying to get the flywheel off and they're using a hammer or something, I don't know. Anyway, you can bend it easy. These things, they, they bend easily. They really do. So everything um, that I do, I check it on every single crankshaft. Used, new, whatever, it just has to be done so that you know. Now, um, okay, so another thing that's interesting is the high, high limit spec from Rotax is two thousandths of an inch. So two thousandths of an inch doesn't sound like very much, does it? Yes? Why would they send that out? Well, I guess you'd have to assume that it was right when it left their place, but it still got shipped and hammered and dropped and banged around, and maybe that's, you know, right? I mean, it's still shipping and handling. Have I had crooked brand new ones that I've sent back? Yes, I have. They've been out of spec. Can I straighten it? Absolutely. It's a brand new crank. Am I going to do that? Nope. Send it back. Right? Like a, a crank that I would say take out of your engine that's a little bit high spec, well, let's, I'll, I'll true it and I'll make it straight, right? Now, the, the thing I was going to say is that the uh, at 2000, if I take a brand new one out of the box at 2000s run out, then it doesn't exceed the limit, right? 2000 is the high end. So if it's more than two, I should send it back. It's defective. But if it's 2000 or it's one and nine tenths, just under, Okay, well, you can use it. Well, guess what? No. You, you can if you want, but it'll probably have a bearing failure in about 50 hours. Okay, so this is why these bearings have problems. Um, yeah, 30 to 50 hours. So that's, that's the case. Um, so typically what it was, and I've been checking these things forever, and I would always put them in the fixture, and I would check them, and they had a you know, corner of a thou, you know, maybe a half a thou, and that was it. They were like straight. They were nice. Anyway, then COVID happened and not so much anymore. So I, you know, you really, if, if you're going to do your own engine and you bought a new crankshaft, make sure it's straight before you put it in the engine. Okay, just because it's new doesn't mean it's right. Could have been dropped a hundred times before you got it. Yes. Oh. Okay. Question is, how many uh, locations do I check it at? And yeah, I, I should have put a picture up here on this, but uh, it um, you you do it with all the bearings on it, so it's complete the way it would be when it comes out of your engine or it comes out of the box uh, new. Uh, it's it's uh, supported by the. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about uh, let's see let's let's just do a 582. So it has two PTO bearings and two mag end bearings, and it's supported underneath the inner the innermost PTO bearing and the innermost mag bearing. Okay, so it's it's held that way. 
So it's not on centers, like on, on a sled, they do it from centers off the end. It doesn't work on an airplane. Uh, anyway, then each, each uh, the center bearings, because you know there's two bearings in the middle, right, where the seals are, each one of those bearings gets a dial indicator on it. And then out near the end of the PTO end, there's a spec for how far, but near the end, and near the end where the, the, uh, the keyway is for the flywheel on the other end. So there's four indicators. So what you do then is you, uh, you just hold a connecting rod and you, and you use the connecting rod and you just pump it slowly to turn it and check them all and see what the run out is. And then and I record it all on, I record it on the sheet that comes with it actually. And then that goes in the file for the engine. So I have a record of where it was when, when I got it or when I put the engine back together. So the, the difference with, and I'll say this right now anyway, because we're, we're already talking about it, it's a good spinoff here for uh, rebuilt crankshafts. So if you take your crankshaft to a sled place to have it rebuilt, the, how they do it is when they true it, they put it in between two centers, like in a lathe, say, in the end of it. Okay, so they're holding it by the ends. And then they're doing the run it on it. If they get it down to a couple or three thousand, they're pretty happy. You know, they're, that's pretty good for a sled. But the issue is that when you do it that way, all of the flywheels, which is the, you know, the flat pieces on either side of the connector rod is the flywheel, they're all kind of moving like this. So it's all straight all the way through, but everything's kind of moving around, which changes the load on the bearings. And it doesn't work for an airplane. So just if you were, if you were thinking of that, it just doesn't work. Because it's it maybe it works okay in a sled, but it doesn't work on aircraft. So one of the first, the biggest things is, of course, let's not get the rust in the engine. All right, let's let's do whatever we can do to to, to keep the rust away. Um, so you know, it's the same old deal. I had a great time today. I'm coming back tomorrow. I'm coming back Monday, and yeah, that doesn't happen. It's like three weeks later before you get back again. Well. You're just leaving this engine exposed to the, to the elements. Um, so what, what can we do? We can plug the exhaust port, like the tailpipe, okay? So uh, typically something that fits tighter is better um, than, uh, you know, you could put a tennis ball over it, that works. You could put an oily wiper in it, that works, whatever. So the wind can't get through, right? We're trying to keep the air out. Excuse me. Uh, cover the air filter. What I do, I give out all the time with that. Like an engine leaves my place, it goes out with a with a plug for the tailpipe. It goes out with a cover for the air filter and everything else because I want I want them really to make an effort to try and keep this from getting rusty. Um, the uh, shower caps from the dollar store, you get a whole bag full of them for two bucks. Put that over the air filter when it gets dirty. Throw it out and get another one. You know, it's it doesn't have to be complicated. And the biggest thing is, do you fog it, right? Do you fog your engine? So what's fogging? Fogging is when the engine's running to introduce some storage solution, fogging solution, whatever you'd like to call it, into the carburetor so that it goes through the whole engine, right? Because anything that goes into carburetors goes through the whole engine. So that's what you should do. Now, okay, so we'd already started on this one. So when the engine's at idle speed, you take the air filter off and you can spray it in with a can, although you have to stand right beside the spinny thing and most people don't like to do that. You know, right? Some people are, I, I don't, if, I, if I, I'm doing this all the time and if it's something I can reach, if you're working on a running engine, you need to have only work with one hand to do something, turn a screw, the other hand, you need to hang on. I hang on to something that won't let me go too far, and I never, ever let go. If I'm going to do some other adjustment, okay, shut it off, okay? Do the adjustment, let's start it up again and check and see where we're at. So it's, uh, it's dangerous, and uh, we don't want to do that. But that's what you need to do. So Rotax is saying exactly that, right? It tells you how much to spray in the carburetors when it's running, standing beside the propeller. Um, and then if you have one that is plugged up, then you can introduce some through the spark plug holes if you're going to leave it for a little longer period of time. 
if you have a, an inverted engine like on a Challenger, it's pretty tough to get the stuff to go up. It doesn't work. So what I do, here's, here's a plug for me, is I have this engine fogging kit that you can put right on the airframe. So when you're finished your flight at the end of the day, and you're just sitting there for a minute and uh, letting the engine cool off, uh, you can open the valve on it and it'll fog the engine for you. And then it's done. And it doesn't fill it so it doesn't want to start next time, you know, like because sometimes when you spray it in the carburetors, it's hard to get them going after because it puts so much in. So uh, I have those. They work really well. Um, and it doesn't matter which way your engine is. On my Challenger, I just put it behind the back seat. So it's out of the weather, it's out of the way. And uh, like I say, I come in, I stop, and I just get out and I open the valve. When it starts to smoke out of the tailpipe, I close the valve, shut the engine off, I'm done. Because, you know, I'm always going to go back in two or three days, but it's like three weeks or a month. Uh, another issue is carburetor racing, which is interesting um, because you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, carburetor racing on a two stroke? Nope, never happens, impossible. Yeah, it does. That's, I think that's probably my carburetor. I don't know. I've got a million iced carburetor pictures of, of two stroke. So this is what you typically see when you don't take the air filter off, right? You got all the frost all over it. The float bowl never, uh, never frosts over. So uh, does it happen? Yeah, there you go. That actually, that is my engine for sure. That one. Uh, so what do we get? We get power loss, of course. You know, you, you'll be cruising along and they got the throttle locked and all of a sudden, you know, you'll just start, to, just sounds a little different and you just start to lose very slowly, you lose a little altitude if you're just going straight and level. And then, uh, so that's what happens there. Then if you happen to be coming into land then and you pull the power back, it, it just feels like the engine's going to jump off the airplane because it's jumping around so much, it's running so rough and it doesn't want to idle. But the very worst part is, is it gives you much increased heart rate. <laughs> all right? You increased heart rate for sure because you're, you're looking for a field, you know, you're going, oh man, this thing's going to quit. Where am I going to go? Now, eventually, and I'll tell you something that I learned before, when I had an issue with this before, I used to always be going to Montebello. Uh, of course, that's the end of January, beginning of February. So the perfect icing conditions well, you can get ice in the summertime, of course, we know that. But in the winter, just above freezing, super high humidity, you know, soft snow, wet snow, carb ice, guaranteed, guaranteed. So if you leave the throttle locked and don't do anything, eventually it'll run so lousy that it'll backfire and it blows the ice out and it runs again. I know that because that's, that's, that's it. That's how it works. Which, which led me to invent this carburetor heater kit for the two strokes. So uh, it's a, uh, there's a hole in the side of the carburetor, you can see where that is, uh, with just a little plug in it and you tap it and you put this heating element in it and the wiring that goes with it and, and the kit comes complete, all the switches and tap and drill and all the other stuff that you might need and solves the problem. So uh, it's, it's been out for years and years and years now. And tested it first on my plane and my next door neighbor's plane. And of course, it was fantastic, worked great. So I've, uh, they, and they don't always go to where it's cold. Like I've shipped them down to the bayou where it's in the swamps and everything. I've shipped them all over the place. So it uh, doesn't have to be cold in the wintertime to have car ice. And a lot of places where somebody lives right on the coast or the shore of a big body of water, right? That, that makes a difference too because the air is so damp. Uh, also, recently now, uh, for 912, electric carb heat for that one too. Um, works, works very, very well. And, um, and there we go. All right, that was probably a lot of stuff. Questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, carb heat continuously on is the question. Uh, yes, you can. When I first put it on, on my airplane, that was, I don't know, a long time ago. Um, my thought on the whole thing, and I had tested it for, for temperature rise in the shop at 60 degrees, but, you know, there's nothing like putting it on the airplane and using it. So um, 
So my thought was just leave it on continually to prevent. Okay. So of course, uh, being inquisitive and wanting to know, I went up in this, you know, just above freezing, wet, soft snow thing. And yes, there was no carburetor ice at all. So I went, okay, I'm going to turn this thing off. So I turned it off and I flew it until I knew it was icing up. And then I left it a little longer and I turned it on. And it didn't take very many seconds for it actually to start to chuggle a bit because it was drinking the water and run normally again. So the thing actually even melted it. So I went, score. This is even better than I better than I wanted. So uh, and that's that's the same kit that I've sold for twelve or thirteen years now, probably. So it's worked very well. Yes. Oh, another question? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold that thought for one second. Okay, cool. So, question anyway. Uh, yeah, but they changed this thing on me, so give me a second. Oh, okay. So, what that what that is is electric carburetor heater kit for a nine twelve Bing sixty four. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, if you're if you're building a um, a home built or what is something and you need to have it inspected and it has a 912 on it they're looking for carburetor heat on it so the there's two options buy the kit that goes around the muffler with all the hoses and use the hot air on it or put electric kit on it and use the the uh, heat the carburetor body so all right question yes the um the heater kit is that something that a person can install or would you recommend that someone self-install I heard you mention about tapping the hole. Put it together. Okay. Are you capable of installing the electric car heater kit? Um, absolutely. So the nine, just to skip a little, the nine twelve. There's no drilling, tapping, or anything. It, it just screws on, so it's nice. Now on the two stroke, I said there's a a cavity there with a little plastic cap over it. What we're doing with the drill is we're just cleaning it to make sure it's the perfect size. You're not really drilling a hole. You're just cleaning the edges to make sure the hole is the right size for the tap. And the only thing that I do say is, if you're not comfortable with the, using the tap, because you have to get it straight, right? And then find somebody that, uh oh, find somebody that uh, that can do that for you, that, that can, oh, I broke it. <laughs> That's why I was holding the wire, because I thought it was gonna quit. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, hello, okay, all right, all right, I'll just stay still, stay still. So if, if you can, if you are, yeah, it's probably ice enough, needs a carbine. <laughs> if, uh, if you can find somebody, if you're not comfortable to do that, or take it to, I don't know, take it to your local machine shop or something and see if they can just run it in. It's, it's, you're tapping into, uh, you know, basically like aluminum, it's easy as pie to do it. Yeah, just go slow, take your time, and when you do it, then you need to be looking at the carburetor and make sure is it straight this way and the other plane, and just go slow and run it in and out and let the chips come out and stuff like that. So, okay, I, yeah. I asked that because I, I've done my own tapping on homemade machines, and stuff, yeah. and that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Is you don't get to scrape your screws. So, <laughs> so it's not hard to do, especially with aluminum now. Yeah. It's just... Um, and that's what I was expecting for the answer. If you're not comfortable, never did it before. It's yeah. Someone else do it. Exactly. Get get some help. You know, no no end to no end to say enough is enough. It's like when you're flying in the winter and it's snowing or something. You go, should I land there? Yeah, you should. <laughs> no end to stop. <laughs> yes. And don't okay. And don't go too deep. So this is uh, I yeah I, I kind of forget who did that, but somebody really pushed the drill in and went. You, you don't, the hole is deep enough. You don't need to make it deeper. You just clean the sides and they put it right through into the inside, into the patch into the carburetor. It doesn't matter as long as you leave the carb heater in it, it will seal it. So even if, even if you do that, because yeah, that was sort of interesting. <laughs> okay. But uh, anyway, anything else? Yes. Going back to your uh, tank cap run out. Yes. Okay, can you check the run out at home on your own engine? You, 
you actually, there is one inspection that you can do, and you can take the, the lower pulley off if it's a Challenger, or take the gear off if it's a gearbox one, and you can put a dial indicator near the end of the PTO, and you can check it. So uh, say um, uh, that's a kind of a quickie prop strike thing. So if you, you know, that's, it really should be completely dismantled and inspected, but that's a good way to have an indication anyway. Oh, okay. All right. Um, what, what you need is you need a, a really strong fixture. It can't move because remember, we're, we're measuring into 10 thousands. So if the crankshaft can move in its little cradle, you're going to get a false reading. Is it both bearings on the end? Uh, no, it's resting on the two inner bearings. Um, and, uh, and that's how you check it. So actually on the, on the, well, somebody sent me a, a, a request anyway on the YouTube to do a uh, crankshaft truing or inspection video. So I'll probably pull it up shortly for that one in a few minutes. But you need a really sturdy fixture to put it on. You, you can't just cobble something up because you won't get the right readings. So, and then, and then when you go to true it, well then you, you, need to, you need to know where to give it a little tap or you'll be making it worse than better. Yes. Okay, I'll follow that. Uh, obviously, that you, you do this. So if someone, again, uh, is not comfortable, never done it before, um, how long would it take and what would you charge to test and true the crank that someone wants to put back in after an inspection? If they're doing that themselves, would you do that? Okay, what I, okay so question is, could somebody send me their crank and I would inspect it? First off, um, it would probably be better if you drove it in because I don't know what the shipping would be like on it. To, to, to properly package it up so that it would, would withstand that, right? Because I've, I've got some stuff in the boxes that are beat to death, and other times it's like brand new. So um, what, I, what I do with those is I do the whole process on it. So I do what I do if I would take the crankshaft out of your engine for an inspection. And the, the first thing I do as a visual inspection on it is it got rust on it. If it's got rust on it, it's over because what happens if, if it shows rust on one of the flywheels uh, or anywhere outside, then we must assume that it's inside the rod bearings where we can't see fully. So that's what the criteria is for that. So if it doesn't have corrosion on it, then the next thing that I do is another bit of a process is to inspect the connecting rod big end clearance. So I wash the big end bearing out with gasoline, blow it all out so that I know that I don't have any oil film or anything in it. So I want metal to metal because I want to measure it. Then I have a special fixture that bolts onto the crank, uh, uses a dial indicator, and then I can check and see what they call the radial clearances. So there's clearance on the side of it. You can check with a feeler strip, you know, where those two brass, the, uh, the shims are. That's the one thing, but this is radial. So how much play do we have? How much does the connecting rod move up and down on there? So it has to pass that to make it to the next step which will be looking at all the bearings visually. And, uh, and then it goes to the next step, which is put it on the fixture to see if it's straight. Because at this point, it's good, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to use it, right? Because it's been ticking all the boxes so far. So now I want to find out if it's true. So is it, is it not true? Then I need to, to straighten it. And sometimes some of them are tough to do, and some of them are easy to do. So uh, you know I can spend a couple hours on that easy to do that. Now. Um, on 582s, when we're looking at the option of, well, why spend the time, why don't you just put a new crankshaft in it? Okay, here's why. The, uh, first off, why spend the money on it when you don't have to? If the crankshaft is still serviceable, let's use it again, right? That's what I would like to do. If it was me, that's what I would want, and, uh, and that's the way I check these. Um, a new crankshaft for a 582, um, pre-March this year, I'll just round it and say they're like two grand. Okay, so two thousand dollars for a new crankshaft. There was a price increase early in the spring, and they're now thirty-five hundred dollars. Okay, so it's like, yeah, I just put a new one in it. So you might not want to. Anyway, we have uh, exceeded our time by three minutes. Oh, hello. How are you? 
So uh, thank you all for attending today and for the good questions. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm honored to do these presentations. It's, uh, it's great.